So a warm welcome also from my side to the panelists and all the participants. Glad to have you here. We have one and a half hour for four highly interesting panelists. And then I would propose that we have before we start that we have between 10 and 15 minutes presentation and after that for each person. And then after that, we have the uh, Q and a session and I will also use the slider and question coming from slider. But as Marcus said, and as you've heard already in the morning, who heard it, uh, the climate crisis, we can't handle alone. So what we need is cooperation, co collaboration and partnership. And that's also the topic of this session now. And what we have here, as I said, we had four speakers and they will present uh, which kind of cooperation partnership they already uh, practice and what's the outcome of this and which lessons learned and experiences they uh, have from this partnership. And then, of course, what we are interested in in particular is where are still gaps and niches in the international landscape? And of course, which kind of recommendation could each of them provide us to further fine tune our work, what we are doing and planning to do on climate action at UNOSA? And now I want to start. I want to start with Sara Venturini. Sara is the climate coordinator at the group on Earth observations, leading the organization's engagement priority related to the implementation of the Paris Agreement. She has 13 years of professional experience collaborating with UN bodies and advising governments and organizations in developing climate change adaptation policies. She put her scientific expertise also at the service of art projects, and she was included in the film anthology Interdependence. And Sara is Venturini, as it sounds, in Italian, and she had a PhD coming from the university in Venice. Sara, I would say the floor is yours, but before I start, because you have your presentation on the value of collaboration on Earth observation for climate action. And you and Barbara work together, and I've heard that Albre uh, uh, Albrecht was also involved on the report Greenhouse Gases Mentoring for Space, a mapping of uh, capabilities sorry, across public, private and hybrid satellite missions. This report was prepared in advance to the COP26 meeting and it was developed in collaboration with the group on Earth Observation, Climate Trace and the World Geospatial Industry Council. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Margit, and uh, uh, lovely introduction, uh, very comprehensive. So I don't have anything to add, except I'd like to share my screen so I can start. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks for having me in, in this session to address the value of cooperation and, and partnership. I'm, I'm going to present some of the relevant ongoing work within the group on Earth observations, which I represent as climate coordinator. And I'd like to start um, with recalling that Earth observations are embedded in, in the founding articles of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change under which the Paris Agreement was adopted in 2015. And I have borrowed this image from the UNFCCC Secretariat to highlight the, the value chain perspective. In this continuum, you, you recognize the key partners, including space agencies and other uh, partners acting upstream on the observation side. And as far as GEO is concerned, we sort of sit at the interface between observations and climate services as we really source earth observations and with them uh, geo activities work to develop decision support applications uh, they prototype uh, services in collaboration with and for a diverse range of users 
And, and all this is meant to leverage public and private resources towards Earth observations, including space-based and ground-based observations. So for those who are not familiar with GEO, um, ultimately our mandate is to help governments access and use Earth observation data to strengthen climate policy, but also uh, disaster risk reduction, sustainable development, and other um, um, important policy um, drivers. And we work with almost 120 UN member countries and over 130 participating organizations, regional organizations, international organizations, academia, and commercial sector partners. And um, how we do this is by promoting open uh, knowledge, meaning access not just to the data, but also to methods and results that are needed to uh, enable the development of Earth observation-based um, applications and tools. And we also work on knowledge products targeting the main policy drivers like the Paris Agreement and the Sendai Framework, including uh, with policy briefs and uh, practical guidance for countries on how to uh, integrate Earth observation into their processes. And finally, we support uh, ways in which Earth observation can uh, be um, scaled up, uh, and in turn, those can support uh, access to finance for climate action. I will tell you more about this. Uh, but uh, currently, um, the, the GeoWork program really focuses on supporting the implementation of the UNFCCC and IPCC. And uh, today, in 2021, we have over 60 activities, including these four flagships that um, really cover key sectors uh, with the suite of decision support um, application and, and services. And in particular, as you, you can see, biosphere observations for ocean and land are a key area for GEO. Um, the, the coordinating body within GEO that deals with climate matters is the Climate Change Working Group, which was established in 2020. And this group gathers about 100 experts to uh, promote action on climate mitigation, adaptation, and loss and damage, and of course, improve coordination internally among geo activities and, of course, um, external coordination and engagement with um, our key partners. And uh, of course, there is a roadmap for all our climate um, related activities, and, and these include. Uh, well, most notably, the, this year, the, the Geo Climate Workshop, our participation at COP26, and the annual, um, our annual event, which is the, called the Geo Week. Um, and next year, we plan also to engage on the regional level uh, a bit more. So, quick overview of Geo Week 2021 that was held um, the last week of November. And in, in this event, uh, there were several sessions dedicated to climate action, climate finance, and, and nexus areas such as climate and ocean, climate and nature-based solutions. And uh, there was also a big focus on resilient cities and human settlements, uh, which was then um, approved and confirmed as a priority engagement area for GEO. And this will trigger uh, the, um, the development and establishment of a, of a new dedicated working group. We also had um, an industry track and a youth track, and uh, notably a um, youth community of practice was um, also launched at the, at the GEO Week to further engage with, um, with young um, researchers and practitioners for climate. On the... Oh, on the Geoclimate um, work, um, Working Group, um, there's another important event this year that was the, the Geoclimate Policy and Finance Workshop organized by the Working Group. This was held in, uh, in September. Um, this was the second uh, workshop of this kind for Geo. The first one was held in um, 2018. And in summary, really, the workshop um, brought clarity on the unique contribution and, and role of GEO, especially with regard to climate adaptation support from the existing GEO um, uh, activities. 
And um, at the workshop, uh, we also launched a, this new dedicated um, work stream on um, climate finance uh, that will be implemented in 2022 and, and is meant to involve the geo community in opportunities to apply Earth observation as a critical tool to unlock finance for climate friendly projects in developing countries, but also um, to support private investment decisions by uh, corporates, by banks, pension funds, and insurance companies that can use Earth observation to strengthen their um, risk assessments, for instance. And uh, finally, the workshop, of course, was an occasion to uh, strengthen or, or build partnership with um, geo partners and new potential uh, associates. And uh, at COP26, we also had a good presence with the side events, but importantly, we participated in the negotiations for research and systematic observation. And I would like to highlight here that this agenda item is the main entry point for our, the Earth observation community in the in the policy negotiations. And the conclusion from this year's negotiation really emphasized the role of partnerships and collaboration, especially at the national and, and regional level for Earth observations. And we are pleased that uh, GEO got a mention there. Um, that will enable us to continue seeking a mandate from the UNFCCC to deliver on certain products and services that we're working on. And of course, uh, all the partners like CEOs and WMO uh, were also mentioned to continue their, um, their mandate that they already have. And next year, uh, COP27 will be hosted by Egypt, and this will mean that the focus will be on priorities for African countries, which is important when you talk about uh, Earth observation for adaptation. So in view um, of, of, of that, we are working on uh, technical guidance to integrate Earth observation into national adaptation plans, especially targeting uh, least developed countries in, in Africa and other continents. And uh, first, we would like to do this uh, for the agriculture sector, but we aim to develop um, a series of guidance documents really in other sectors, including um, ocean, coastal areas, uh, biodiversity, mountain areas, uh, building on existing geo um, work program activities. For mitigation, uh, mostly the work in GEO is led by CEOs, and this year we really uh, brokered some new um, important collaborations uh, with the IPCC Task Force on National Greenhouse Gas Inventories um, on using space-based information and, and state-of-the-art uh, technology to develop greenhouse gas inventories. Um, we also uh, brokered a uh, dialogue among the atmospheric greenhouse gas and FLU communities to contribute to the global stock take. So we are pleased that we serve a little bit like a uh, like a platform for for existing um, initiatives. Um, also, I wanted to highlight that under the geo umbrella, we work with um, stakeholders that are not usually engaged in earth observation. And this includes indigenous peoples and local communities through the um, Geo Indigenous Alliance, which was founded by indigenous representatives at the 2019 um, Ministerial Summit in Canberra, Australia. Um, and now coming to the to the report that Margit has mentioned at the at the beginning, I wanted to highlight that uh, at COP26 we did launch this uh, outcome of uh, uh, this novel collaboration between government space agencies and commercial satellite companies, which uh, was um, supported by by us, by Climate Trace and the World Geospatial Industry Council. And this report really is a joint effort to map uh, the current and um, planned satellite missions that measure greenhouse gases. You can download the report from, from the GEO website also, or, or the WGIC website. And um, this report was really mandated by the 2020 High Level Forum on Innovation in Remote Sensing Technologies for Accelerated Climate Action, which was an initiative sponsored by the 
UK climate action champion, Nigel Topping, and ex-vice uh, president of the US, Al Gore. And, and this report really is aimed to provide a, a full picture for the use of policymakers within the UNFCCC process. Here you can see um, a bit of a report outline. Um, the, it is really structured to, to give an overview of the technical capabilities of the relevant satellite missions, as well as um, case studies and, and examples. And it concludes with um, key policy messages highlighting um, strategic needs uh, that, um, that there may be. And I think the most valuable aspect of the report is that it contains a, a complete and up-to-date database, which was um, compiled through a um, transparent and participatory review process. Um, in the process, we identified 33 missions for the three relevant greenhouse gases, uh, including from government space agencies, commercial satellite companies, and also public-private partnerships. And uh, in the database, there's also an indication of the relevant um, application scale or potential application scale of the missions. For instance, whether the data collected can be used for assessment of greenhouse gas emissions at the um, asset level for um, a power plant, for instance, or national level greenhouse gas inventories, or potential use for uh, the aggregate mitigation assessments that are needed under the, the new process called the global stock take under the Paris Agreement. So the report really ends with a call for continued cooperation between public and private sector to fully maximize the complementary capacities and synergies and overcome the existing limitations that are faced by both sides. And noting that the space agencies can really bring a wealth of knowledge that is built on, on global data coverage and, and long-term missions for a sustained data collection and, and also innovation around greenhouse, emission, greenhouse gas emission monitoring um, at the same time, the private sector can bring higher uh, spatial, temporal, and, and spectral resolution, um, speed to market, and also can integrate this information into business processes more easily for those needing the, the information. So I really invite you to, to have a look at it, and um, I leave you with that. This concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you again for having me, and I'm available for questions now or later if you can, uh, if you want to contact me at this address. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. Since I've said at the beginning that Barbara Ryan was also involved in giving the order that we got at the beginning, I would say we continue with Barbara Ryan, if it's okay. <laughs> I see her here. Thanks a lot. Barbara. Barbara started her career at the United States Geological Survey. She was director of the World Meteorological Organization Space Program. She also was secretary director of the Intergovernmental Group on Earth Observations in Geneva. And in January of this year, she became the executive director of the World Geospatial Industry Council. And not enough. Under Barbara's leadership, millions of satellites, images, and other Earth observation, uh, Earth observation data had been made available to the general public, and not only available, but also free of charge. Barbara, you are now presenting us this cooperation between the public and the private sector and public-private partnership in advancing for climate action. And as I understand, the colleagues from UNOSA are presenting your presentation. And you just have to say, next slide, please. But I don't see the presentation. Colleagues, please, if you could highlight, please, and bring up to the screen Barbara's presentation. 
I would be grateful. You can, um, Barbara, you can start maybe, and we are working on it and bringing up the presentation in a second. That's fine. And I can also share it from here if that's better. I have it loaded also. It's coming. Okay. Here we go. All right. Well, listen, uh, Margie, thank you. And Marcus, thanks so much to all the organizers for extending an invitation uh, to WGIC. Um, let's see. Next slide. <clears throat> yes, I would uh, like to just spend a minute or two talking about WGIC because it is an unusual organization. I'd like to go into enabling conditions and then certainly uh, end the talk with the importance of public private partnerships for which um, the report that care, uh, Sarah talked about is really just an outstanding example in, in my mind of a public private partnership. Um, so WGIC is a, a global, in fact, to the best of my knowledge, the first uh, global trade association for private sector companies working in the geospatial sector. So while we're a not-for-profit organization, you have to be a private sector company to join WGIC. And so if there's anybody in the audience that is a private sector uh, company working in earth observations or geospatial, please reach out to us. The next slide will show our current members. We've got a, a really good composition of uh, the major companies that are working in this trade space. Uh, next, let's go back a slide um, so that they can see those major companies that are working uh, globally. And while we have good regional examples of trade associations, what we are trying in Europe, the European Association of Remote Sensing Companies, in the United States, MAPS, and in India, AGI, we're trying to network with those regional trade associations so that we can have a more consistent story from all of these members because. As you'll see from these um, companies, many of them are working globally. Next slide. We also have a number of key partners, and you will see familiar faces here, whether it's uh, ISO TC211 or ITU, OGC, the UN Statistics Division. And so um, any um, international organizations that are in fact working in the same trade space, uh, we are interested in uh, partnering uh, with them. The next slide will actually show uh, some policy reports that we have done. We started out with the protection of personal privacy information on the far left and on the far right. We did uh, geospatial, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. And then in the middle, which I think might be particularly relevant to this audience, is public-private geospatial collaborations and exploring potential partnership models. Um, and so I would just, uh, all of these reports are accessible off our, um, off our website, and I would encourage you to take a look at them. In addition to trying to emerge as a voice for the geospatial industry with our trade association, we do a fair amount of policy advocacy work. And in this regard, those reports each have looked at legislation around the world that pertain to each one of these topics. And then we go forward and put recommendations or lessons learned from that work. So again, um, please take a look at those reports off our website. Okay, next slide. Um, uh, we'll talk about some enabling conditions for action. Um, and I'd like to just drill in with a slide or two for each of these, certainly on open data, on building on what's been done, better integration and coordination, and, and then hyper-partnering. But what is so important, and Sarah already mentioned it, are linkages to the policy mandates that are out there globally. So whether it's the Paris Agreement or the Sendai Framework for Disasters or the Sustainable Goals, which I know this conference is spending a lot of time talking about, it is so important that those of us working in the geospatial and earth observation trade space tie back into those policy mandates so that whether you're in the public sector or the private sector, we can reinforce those messages that our governments need to adopt. Next slide, we'll spend just a minute talking about open data. Uh, Margit mentioned it in uh, my, the introduction of me. Um, the 
we, the Landsat story, and maybe many of you have seen this story, but um, the first Landsat satellite was launched in 1972. And for 30 plus years, um, the Geological Survey, it was my organization at the time, sold that data, with the exception of the mid 80s when the private sector uh, took over uh, Landsat's um, uh, five and six. Um, and at the peak of data sales, we sold 53 scenes a day. Um, and 53 scenes a day, uh, while it brought in four or $500 million to our organization, which is a fair lot of, is a, is a lot of money. <laughs> um, it's not 53 scenes a day is not a lot when you're collecting global data. So we were, and and I will say that there were many people from the very first Landsat launch. NASA launches the satellites. The U.S. Geological Survey uh, managed the data distribution. Many people were arguing for broad open data, but there were resource constraints, um, largely to the tune of four or five hundred million dollars, um, that had to be shored up. Finally, we were able to convince the president. The Congress to change the data policy in 2007, and this is what happened with that changed data policy. 5,000 scenes, 5,700 scenes a day to this day are being downloaded. So two orders of magnitude. Now, this is just one satellite series in one government. Can you imagine if all Earth observation data that's collected by our government agencies, whether they're state, local, federal, or uh, international, was released broadly and openly. It would revolutionize not only access to data, but access to that knowledge, open knowledge that Sarah talked about in her presentation. So a tremendous increase in scenes, but that's not the whole story. Let's go to the next slide and what you will see is from that one changed data policy, an economic analysis was done in 2011. Now I had left the organization by that time, but they needed a couple years to kind of test that changed data policy. And what it did was show that the US accrued $1.7 billion of economic benefit internationally, 400 million. So that means people around the world were also benefiting economically from that changed data policy for a global total of $2.1 billion, far, far exceeding the 400, um, the $4 million, $4 million or $5 million that the geological survey was taking. And I might have misspoke before. It was four and a half or $5 million that we were taking in from that data sale. So anyway, it's good for national economies, it's good for global economies. If that data that citizens have already paid for in building those sensors, in collecting that data, in standing up those institutions that uh, manage these this data, uh, those data need to be broadly and openly available. The next slide will talk about uh, building on what's been done. You know, there's a really nice animation that Geosciences Australia has done. I've just done a capsule of that. They ingested the entire Landsat archive once it was opened. They've done the same with the Sentinel series of satellites, and they've put an algorithm over that to look at presence or absence of water over the entire continent. You just couldn't afford to do these continental scale analyses if you had to buy each of those scenes. So what you will see here is that they use 27 years of data, a 25 um, pixel resolution, 300,000 scenes, 20,000 passes, and they got that entire uh, analysis down to um, three hours of compute time. So. We need to build on what's done. Um, Australia's done a wonderful job. I understand there are efforts in Africa to do a data cube for the entire continent. We ought not to be reinventing the wheel, uh, but we ought to be able to continue to uh, improve on this work that's already been done. 
Um, next slide, we'll just talk about the importance of better integration and coordination and whether it's internally within our respective organizations nationally regionally or globally, you know, it takes a lot of time. It's so much easier to just go into our own offices and do this work alone. And I'll, I'll tell you, it's a lot of hard work. Um, and yet we still need to do it because if we want to get true changes uh, in how earth observations and geospatial data are used for policy mandates, it's got to be a much broader network that works together. And that brings to the very last slide on the enabling conditions, which is hyper partnering. I, I think it's actually the Association of Investigative Journalists that coined that word hyper partnering. But for me, this leads up to the, the role of public private partnerships because uh, we really do need to bring academia, the commercial sector, not for profits like WGIC and the public sector together. And of course, on the public sector, I would put all those international organizations that are in fact funded by national governments. So those are the enabling conditions that I think are really important for uh, public private partnerships. Let's go to the last couple of slides for the presentation. And this is just um, a couple different slides than, uh, and some are the same that Sarah presented. The greenhouse gas monitoring from space, uh, the two websites that you can download it are, are shown there. And what you will see, and, and this really is the first time that a systematic analysis was done uh, across both public and private sector assets. CS, the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, you'll hear from them uh, next from Albrecht, um, has done an outstanding job collecting this data in a missions and instruments and measurements database, probably for two decades, maybe for 20 years. But we haven't consistently done it for the private sector. So when um, uh, Sarah and I and Climate Trace were talking about this. We thought if WGIC stepped up on behalf of the private sector and maybe played the same role that CS and uh, plays for the public sector, we could put a report together over a rather limited scope. It's just those gases that are uh, recognized by the convention, but. This is, but, but this is the 1st time uh, that this has been done systematically public sector, private sector. And then, of course, we saw the emergence of hybrid missions. Also, next slide. You saw this next slide from Sarah. It does the table is included. Uh, the appendix is available with that data set. And you'll see that um, just for looking at. Carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. So just those three gases, who's collecting them from space? There were 33 missions. The bulk of them were on the public sector side, 21. There were seven private sector missions. Only two are in orbit. And there are five hybrid missions that are emerging uh, in this next decade. Let's look at the next slide. So. Um, these are what I think are some really interesting slides that emerged from the data. If you look at the slide on the left, you will see uh, in orbit, in development, and end of mission, uh, and end of mission uh, missions. Public is shown in blue, private is shown in red, and hybrid is shown uh, in gray. So in orbit, the bulk of the missions are still public with just two private sector missions. In development, you will see it's about a third, a third, a third. Now, again, these are just missions for those greenhouse gases, and it was one public sector mission that is end of life. If we take that same data and look at the right-hand graph and look at it from a percentile basis, what you will see is in the 1990s and in the 2000s, 100% of the missions were public. As we come into the 2011 to 2020 timeframe, you'll start to see the emergence of private sector missions. 
And as we look in this next decade, 2021 to 2030, you will see it's about a third, a third, and a third. A third public missions, a third private missions, and a third uh, hybrid missions. And we presented this graph at the uh, UN FCCC Earth Information Day uh, that Sarah referenced, because for me, um, I think this is one just really interesting. It would be wonderful to see if this same trend, um, in fact, is occurring across hyperspectral missions, across optical missions, across radar missions. Again, this is just those GHG missions uh, from space. Um, and then the last thing, uh, and then we can go to the next slide because we also talked about that same uh, construct, public, private, and hybrid by gas type, and then also by spatial scale. And I want to say something about the spatial scale uh, on the uh, right-hand side of this graph. What we were seeing with those private sector and hybrid missions is that they are finer resolution. So whether it's point source detections or maybe national collects, but they are not collecting data while they have the capability to collect anywhere on the globe, they are not collecting everywhere on the globe. They are more targeted missions with either increased spatial, spectral, or temporal resolution. So the message to the UNFCCC is you need parties still need to finance public sector missions and those public sector space agencies and Private sector missions also need financing largely from other sources, whether it's venture capital funding or whatever. Um, but this entire effort still needs to be financed uh, for looking at this from space. Uh, next slide. And I think, uh, well, you, I won't go into detail this. Uh, you saw this slide from Sarah. It's in the report. Certainly satellite observations can reduce uncertainty. Uh, the private sector is building on decades of work that the uh, public sector has done. We're seeing the increased emergence of hybrid models, and there is absolutely a call for additional collaboration, which also speaks to the importance of public-private partnerships. Next slide. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, and this is my last slide, everyone. Um, I, I would like to uh, just particularly for this audience, uh, harken back to 2006 when CS, the Committee on Earth Observations, put this report together for uh, COP12. While in situ measurements will remain essential and largely measure what cannot be measured from satellites. Earth observation satellites are the only realistic means to obtain the necessary global coverage and uh, with well calibrated measurements will be, and those are oftentimes in situ measurements, will become the single most important contribution to global observations for climate. So I certainly hope that by the time we get to uh, our next conference of the parties, our satellite observations will have come into their own. The last slide just includes my email address if you want to uh, contact me. Margie, I'll turn it uh, back to you. Thank you so much for your time again. Barbara, thanks a lot for this extremely and highly interested presentation and also seeing how the sector is evolving and as everybody knows, it's also called the new space when the private sector is coming in. I think I'm looking forward to the discussion we will have soon. But first, we have two other presentations. The next one is Albrecht von Bargen. Albrecht holds a PhD from the Technical University in Munich. Since more than 40 years, he has been with the German Space Agency and is now senior project officers, officer in the Earth Observation Department. And he represents Germany in respective committees at ESA 
And Albrecht is also the chair of the Joint Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, coordination group of meteorological satellites, working group on climate. So I don't know if it's all one group or it's three groups. Albrecht, you have to explain it. And Albrecht will talk, uh, talk about space based observation supporting the systematic observation of the climate system. I'll Thank you very much, Market. I hope the floor you can. Is yours. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Market. Very uh, for your kind introduction. Just to I will just set up my. Is are you able to see my presentation? Yes, we see it. Thanks. Um, it's just one slide, or yeah, I hope so. Um, Thank you very much, and uh, it's a pleasure to present during the World Space Forum. Uh, I'm sorry that I interrupt you, but we I see on my screen two slides. Maybe the uh, colleagues. Okay, I have just two. Yes, and your notes as well. So now it's fine. Super, perfect. I have one slide. I hope the colleagues from you and also also see one slide. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Um, as you introduced me, I'm the chair of the Joint Committee on Earth Observation Satellite and Coordination Group uh, on Meteorological uh, Satellite Working Group on Climate. And uh, because uh, it seems to be very complicated, I'll be, give a short introduction about this. The Committee of on Earth Observation Satellite uh, is uh, serves as a forum for space agencies. Uh, these are around 34 space agencies. And they are associate members uh, around 29, uh, and they discuss space related topics uh, related to Earth observation. And this is carried out in several working groups and what is called also symmetrical woodwork constellations. What you can see around CEOs, it's a blue, a light blue curve. There are some United Nations organizations and uh, uh, coordinated programs. Those are also associate members to SEOS. And the SEOS is also called the space arm of GEO, traditionally. And the meteorological or operational space agencies, uh, they coordinate themselves together with WMO in CGMS in the Coordination Group on Meteorological Satellites. And both organizations decided to implement uh, a joint working group dedicated to uh, dedicate to climate and to bundle their resources on climate. And this working group is also understood as the interface of both organizations to UNFCCC. And we highly appreciate that UNOSA starts also to attend uh, to our working group meetings. Uh, UNOSA is also active in the working group of capacity building in CS. I will provide you a, on this slide, uh, without going to, too much into the detail, the working group in the nutshell. Uh, we have five core activities. One is the ECB inventory, which is aligned with the gap analysis. We'll come back in a minute. Then on this, we build up uh, use cases for CDS. It's a relative new activity. You will see also one slide on this. And uh, there is one Trina's gas task team, uh, which was formed several years ago, and uh, based on a white paper uh, provided in 2018, the CLS ACBC white paper on the Trina's gas uh, with constellation, there was a development on a roadmap related to Trina's gas uh, constellation. I will come back also later to this. Finally, we are also the space element in GCOS, or the Global Climate Observing System, and contribute to status report and so on. So you will see on the next slide uh, why we do uh, our uh, yeah, our work. Is, uh, uh, this is a provision of systematic observation of the climate system, uh, which is addressing the observational needs of UNFCCC especially the Paris Agreement. And our role is here in close contact, uh, to work in close contact with the Global Climate Observing System 
which defines with its implementation plan the needs and the requirements. And the working group is aware of this and provides input to the implementation plan with its coordinated response. However, more important, the results will be summarized in the uh, Global Climate Observing System status report. In addition, it will be su summarized during the substar at the yearly COP event and present uh, those during the UNFCC COP site events, but also in other places, uh, our statements. So we give uh, a report about this. How do we implement? Uh, we delivered uh, several years ago the architecture for climate monitoring from space. And this relies on a value chain from new space technology down to the provision of information for policymakers and stakeholders, including the building of climate data records and setting up suitable applications. And in this process, also a translation of observation uncertainty into confidence of statements is performed. So this is also provided to the IPCC reports. Let me give you or introduce you to some examples related to climate observations, which are related to global stock date, but also to space capabilities for climate. Uh, let me focus first on mitigation. The cyclic global stock take process as the Creed in Paris is given in the center. The commitment uh, to, to so-called NDCs will be evaluated and there is a feedback and the transparency framework leading to an update of the national implementation. Today, the national greenhouse gas inventories are built on the bottom up approach as shown on the left hand side. And they rely on data from the energy sector, the industrial sector, and the agriculture, forest, other land use and waste sectors. And top down greenhouse gas budgets from, budgets from the atmosphere can complement and enhance the national inventories. This could be demonstrated and had been demonstrated in two country showcases. But I will go more into detail how we like to implement this. Um, space agencies and partners implement a system for a combined top-down, bottom-up approach to monitor the greenhouse gas emissions. This involves a diverse set of measurements from space, but also from ground and also data assimilation techniques. So you see on the left-hand side uh, in the functional uh, sketch, uh, the observations and the center, the integration attribution. This is a modeling and assimilation of all the information which will be fed into the system. And the outputs on the right hand side are the emission removals as from the hotspots, country and regional emission removals and other products. Space agencies and services provide full, free and open access to the top down data and derived information. And so are uh, available for use by all parties. As indicated before, the outputs are capable of reducing the uncertainties in national emission inventory reports, to identify additional emission reduction opportunities, provide nations with timely and quantified guidance on progress towards their emission reduction targets and pledges. Those are the national determined contributions. And finally, track changes in the natural carbon cycle caused by the human activities like deforestation, degradation, and ecosystems and fire. On the space side, a lot of new technology is implemented for monitoring greenhouse gases, as we have seen uh, in the other talks. Especially, I like to uh, uh, underline also the European Copernicus CO2 monitoring mission, but they are also the private or the new business uh, private missions. Under implementation. When we look on the schedule, how we support the global stock, how we plan to support the global stock takes um, at 2020-2018, the white paper had been published. Now, uh, in 2020, the pilot inventory requirements had been defined. And currently, we are defining or we are collecting a 
pilot atmospheric CO2 CH4 inventory, which is just a, a information for the different countries or regions so they can make use of this and they provide us a feedback of this uh, information or uh, the usage of their uh, all this data and from this there should be also a refined atmospheric um, greenhouse gas requirements set defined uh, after 2023 um, we plan to have an initial operational greenhouse gas constellation deployment into 2026, and we will go forward for a refined atmospheric greenhouse gas inventory afterwards and to be operational after the global stock take two. However, <laughs> let me add that space observation capabilities is not restricted to greenhouse gases, it addresses uh, also other uh, observations which are related to the global stock take, the opportunities. Uh, in the yeah, opportunities related to land surface essentially climate variables targeting the Afolo part, and they are strongly working on the com uh, to complement uh, uh, the. Uh, system, the approach, and to support the global stock take. Here you see uh, some examples like the above ground biomass dense and land cover or forest coverage. Um, so we cannot stay only with uh, observations or we see uh, provided uh, data. Uh, what is very important is the engagement with external stakeholders and end users. And for that, uh, it is very critical to have a feedback on the mission inventory community. And also that we have a continued engagement with international policy frameworks like the UNFCCC or Substar or IPCC. And we do have also engagement with the technical entities at international level, like WMO and its different programs, and joint programs supporting the convention, for example, the Global Climate Observing System, as well as the program modeling community. However, uh, it's also important to have a continuous presence at the COP and at the SEPSTA meetings. So, we prepare yearly a sales and CGMS statement at SAPSTA, uh, which is uh, given during the opening session so that the different parties are informed about the progress in satellite observations. And you get also information during the Earth Information Day and other site events during the COP. Apart from greenhouse gas and the Paris Agreement, this joint CGMS working group on climate is working on sustaining and further evolving the space-based capabilities to monitor climate variability and changes. And one uh, integral part is a web-based inventory of existing and planned climate data records for the GCOS essential climate variables. And this is used for a gap analysis to address actions uh, for the different space agencies. And uh, this, uh, <clears throat> the working group makes recommendations and implements these actions to remedy these gaps. Uh, this is also based for the Chico status report contribution. And the 2021 inventory fills per year the identified gaps, uh, which are uh, supporting also the global stock take. And, but what we could also identify is um, before we started the analysis of the global stock take, um, that uh, there will be some additional variable sets uh, needed, which are beyond the current GCOS listed ECVs. However, we do have also special needs on reprocessing, calibration, and validation of um, a space based observation. And this will be also addressed during the gap analysis. 
I go also to the uh, uh, the newest activity which we have in the working group. This is are uh, the use cases of ZERs, which are shall aid the decision making, and the objectives are to demonstrate the value of climate data records for decision making, and to support capacity building by providing use cases for training activities, and to achieve a better understanding of the application needs. And it is planned to have a special WMO application in 2022. And this is a very new activity. So we are very open um, to get new uh, or, uh, applications for new use cases. And this is uh, on the side slide. You can see one of the use cases as an example for your information. So there are climate data records used from satellite observation as input for an hydrological model and for crop model and uh, to provide the fuel security and uh, for an advanced planning. So some takeaway messages, the use of space-based observation uh, of documented quality, and this is a very important part can support the global stock tax by providing new evidence for the success of the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And the greenhouse gas constellation architecture follows a system approach. Space agencies and service providers will grant free and open web based access to the top down data and derived information for use by parties. Uh, and space agencies also provide long term observations for about 35 of the 37 GCOS ECVs, which are accessible by satellite observations, including the carbon cycle ECVs, such as greenhouse gases, above biomass, or permafrost. And finally, such CDRs provide detailed insight in climate observation. And yes, the analysis related global stock take will lead to an extension of the ECV inventory portfolio and use cases from satellite observation, climate data records, AIDS decision-making in various application areas. With that, I'd like to end and I'd uh, like to say thank you. My email address is on the title page, so you can contact me directly if you have any questions. Albrecht, many thanks. <laughs> we, I'm sure there are questions that they will come, but before we go into the discussion, I would like to welcome Michael Staudinger. Michael Staudinger studied meteorology and geophysics in Innsbruck and in Australia. He has been the permanent representative of Austria with the World Meteorolog Meteorological Organization sorry, uh, since 20 and 2010. Michael Staudinger was the CEO of the Austrian Institution for Meteorology uh, and geodynamics for more than 11 years. Before that, he worked in Salzburg for this organization. And this institution offers a broad range of services regarding for our ranging from weather forecast to climate and earthquake monitoring, as well as the constant analysis and prediction for atmospheric pollutants. Michael Staudinger, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Margaret. And to summarize what you said about my work, yeah, I'd like to put it in one phrase. Uh, we always have been users, users of satellite meteorology. And the experience that we gathered over the years, it was just incredible all that we could see and how quick the development went and how systems changed from one to the next from one system to the next. And this is why uh, we, if you see it as a user, no, I've been working very much with first responders, for example, no, mountain rescue and so on. And we've seen catastrophes, natural catastrophes firsthand. Uh, one trade, the insurance, publishes these figures over the last 30 years, unfortunately just to 2018, because in the last two years, the numbers were even higher. These are numbers of incidents down by the various earthquakes and geophysics, 
The rest is meteorology, storm, flood, droughts. You see the curve, the, the curve gets steeper and steeper in the last couple of years. And the, the events we had in Germany last year put billions of billions of damage just in one, two days. There was a typical example of what climate will be looking like in the future. We cannot completely stop this development, but at least warnings can be part of adaptation and good planning can be part of mitigation. For both of them, we need these observation systems. Now, I'll try to go to my next slide. This is what, what floods look like in the mountains. You know, see the existence of people having lived there for centuries is put in, in danger and in risk from one moment to the next. What's very really interesting, and these are the figures behind it in precipitation, and these are percentiles, and you see on the on the summer situation here on the right hand side, you see the seven days of the year with the strongest precipitation. In the last 30 years, the intensity has increased in Austria by 30%. So things are really changing. And this is why we need good forecasting systems more than ever. What Italian machine, the Austrian National Map Service did is to develop an outcasting system. And it's based on in situ observations, on radar, on topography, and in satellites. And a big help came from the rapid scan for Metosat. For every five minutes, new observations are brought in. And with these new observations, you could track clouds in a five minutes time scale. And this is something we, in the past, we could never do before. So this Inca model, it's not used all over the place. It combines these different types of information, puts them together for perfect warnings on the very short scale, what's happening in the next couple of minutes. But this is also extremely important for when you talk about climate forecasts, climate projections, but also planning, how does the agriculture look like in the future? UNITSAT has the SAF program, satellite, satellite application facilities. Technical University of Vienna and ZMG working here together via UMIT CAST, where with the radar system, the ASCAT system, you can see how is the moisture changing in the ground. How is the moisture at the moment? How is it changing over the seasons? Are we in a particular area? Are we late with the moisture we would need in spring? Are we early? Is there too much moisture and it's a problem for the floods? It's the basis for much of the planning for many problems that meteorologists have to work on. And here, the input to climate models, input to IFS of the European Center of Medium Weather Range Forecast, is extremely important to know what the weather is going to look like tomorrow, what the situation is going to look like in two and three months. Now, a system in the making for many, many years is the EOMIS mission from ESA and HumanSat. And it's quite interesting to see also a little bit the history of development of very tricky, very advantaged new systems, because it's a lighter system and it tries to see something. If you look from space into particles of wind to get the wind profile, and it took more than 10 years. And there were quite some failures where it just didn't work. But now, since about a year, the first satellite sentinel is up with the YOLOS uh, sensor. And you have a vertical profile, as you see it here. You have a vertical profile of the wind from not quite the bottom, but near the bottom up to the higher levels of the atmosphere. Something which in the past could only be done with radio sounds. Now you get a complementary observation from satellites, from polar orbiting satellites. This helps meteorology very much. This also has been assimilated into ESM WF, the IFS model, and it brings quite some advantage brings quite some advantage. Also, we have seen already before from my right presentation, global CO2 concentrations. Now, they're extremely important to see what's happening, but also who is doing what. Now, CO2 and methane, they have uh, area emissions from all of us, heating, driving around, but there's also point sources from methane, which can be traced back to a uh, uh, problem of uh, gases at the, at the fossil fuel sites. Uh, when it comes to tracking down who's doing what, when it comes to inventories, which is extremely important now in the COP26 uh, decisions which have been made, who's, who's sticking to the pledges that you promised yesterday? You see how complicated the 
picture becomes. If you look at cities, if you look at the industry, if you look at traffic, air traffic, ships, and so on. But with a combination of different observation systems, with the satellites giving the overall picture, and Barbara showed a very good uh, the development of the last couple of years, how this has developed from the public sector towards the private sector. Huh? You can have a better picture what's happening here, and you can trace it down to yourself in the country, can compare it to the emission uh, scenarios you have from different sources in your country, and you can then take the policies which are necessary on a political level. Another example which was done by which is done by Pekinovel, an Austrian company, it's not a startup anymore because it's well established and does many, many things, is to look at what's happening to the ground. We're sealing so much of our ground and in Austria, about 20% of the ground has been sealed in the last 30 years just by using for tarmac, for traffic, for, for buildings and so on. And Geoville does it on the very fine scale, down to the meter scale, where you can see how does the service look like. It's extremely important for one hand for city climate models, on the other hand the flood models, that you see the percolation of the water into the ground, where does it happen at which speed, where is it not possible at all because the ground is sealed off. Another Austrian company which is Iveo, and they are based in Innsbruck, and they make a daily snow cover from all these sensors from different satellites, and this is for the meteorological models here in Austria, extremely important to know where is the ground covered with snow, how far is the, the moisture in the, in the snow and different properties of the snow, which you can see here. And it gives you a first idea on, for example, an albedo. Now, Josef Aschbacher was uh, making a comment, what's the albedo looking like in the, in the Arctic, when the, the, the Arctic will be ice-free. This is a day-to-day -day problem for forecasting, also here on the regional scale, when you want to know how quick our fronts are moving and how is, for example, the heat exchange between the surface and the atmosphere looking like. I'm sorry, I try to get my next slide, but something seems to be not working here. Colleagues could help. Can the colleagues yeah, help? Just patience and I hope to solve this problem. Otherwise, uh, I'm happy to tell the rest of the story just with this picture, what we've been doing in WMO. In WMO, and this is a very good connection to Barbara Ryan's talk, you know, we decided at Congress this October three different things. One of them was GMON, the Global Basic Observation uh, Network System. The second one is a table policy that the data which are provided by WMO members have a set of data, subset data, which is very large and is very large in comparison to the past, which are exchanged for free, which means they're open to the public for commercial use. There's no limits on this use. And the third, and this is the interesting part, which might also be interesting for satellite for the satellite community, is the SOF, is the Systematic Observation Financing Facility which is a financial mechanism from 13 development agencies and development banks to support those members which cannot provide the data in a way that they have the financial means for the observations in countries where there's large areas with little population and small GDPs, small financial cap capacities. And this use in with the private sector, to work with the private sector in a way that, for example, data are provided as data as a service, or it's a combination between the public and the private sector hybrid model, and we're testing out in WMO these models to see how can data be generated in the best ways between these different actors. This would also bring me, and I'm sorry that this, I don't know what, uh, there seems to be some interference with my computer. This would bring me to my conclusions. What we need in the future in meteorology, and you've seen how much, the, how big the challenges are which we are facing. What we need is a sustainable provision from data. And it's easy to say, and I come back to the, the soft solution to the financial questions which uh, many countries have. Huh? It's easy to say data should be made available for free. It's much trickier than to bring the financial funding for that 
what have we done in the long run? And the second point, when, when it comes to sustainable, uh, it seems to work, yeah. When it comes to sustainable observations, is this has not been mentioned uh, uh, today yet in the talks, but Josef Hashmoda had an interesting story written about him in the Financial Times yesterday. It's uh, space debris. In the range of 1,000 to 1,200 kilometers where satellites stay for a long time, debris is accumulating, and with a huge number of small satellites coming in there, uh, the satellite community needs a mechanism to keep the space clean there. Yeah. Because otherwise, in meteorology, we depend on very much on day-to-day -day observations. And if there is some larger disturbances, and I think you all know the Kessler uh, effect, which can happen there, we have a big problem in meteorology. This brings me to the end of my talk. Sorry that I couldn't show the rest of the slides, but I think you've got the gist of it. Back to you, Margaret. Well, maybe just as you see the picture now here, this is the comparison in blue, where it's from meteorology, is done by satellites, and in green, with these little green stars, where it's done uh, with in situ observation at the moment. And how this was calculated with the IFS model, where certain systems in the rerun of the model were skipped, were not taken into account, and you see the quality drops by 2.5% if, for example, the microwave sounder and imager is not used. Uh, and you see overall 6.3% is satellite, 3% is in situ observation. With that, back to you, Margaret. And thanks for your patience. Thank you very much, Michael. I would say what we've heard so much before is data, free data, open data. And data is not data because you have several uh, Earth observation data which you can't compare. So my question is, and now also having this new space economy, and as uh, Barbara was telling or saying, or showing us that the private sector is coming in and providing data. So how can we bring this public, of course, public good of Earth observation data, private data, because they want to make a business out of it. It's not a, it's a, not a miracle and it's understandable that they want to make business because they invest. So, but how can we bring these two parties together to provide data and which data do we still need? And I think that's the question to, I would say to everybody, but I would first ask Barbara to give an answer or maybe provide some answer. Okay, thanks, uh, Margie. And I think, you know, what you're right, The there are different roles that the public sector and the private sector have. And so clearly the private sector uh, right now is using uh, data as its currency. But, you know, there were a couple questions in the chat box. I think, honestly, I think we're going to see that change over time. I think it it may take five or 10 years, uh, but I think we're going to start to see private sector space agencies move to a services model. So uh, the data is um, maybe secondary or it's an input to those services, but it's no longer the currency itself. For right now, so so I think that that is what I think is going to happen in the future. Um, what we have right now are a couple good examples where some private sector companies are setting aside some assets for anybody, not maybe not anybody to use, but either conservationists in the case of Maxar, or in the case of uh, the Planet in Norway um, model. Norway procured. Uh, a fair amount of data from Planet Planet Labs, and now is making that available to researchers doing tropical research. So we've got ex little examples of that where you're seeing the envelope pushed a little bit. Um, but I think it's going to change as we. I think it's a changing environment with just so much data coming in. Okay, and then just one other thing because the question was, what if a number of partners got together? to in fact procure some data, then could the um the then could it be made more broadly and openly available? And I think that's a model that you'll also see in the future. Thanks. Thank you very much, Barbara. I don't know, <clears throat> Michael, maybe you want to add something? Sure, sure. I'd be happy to and I would like to compliment what Barbara just been saying. But maybe see it from the again as a use and from the end of the value chain. 
uh, if we understand what should be defined as a public good and which is the atmosphere, which is the climate, which is the data, the knowledge about the climate. I think you might steer the, the discussion in the right direction. And if you say we have one, as you said in your last picture, about we just have one planet, we have one atmosphere, and we have all of us have to take care of it. And then I think the last, the COP26 and COP from uh, in Paris gives a very good basis where we say Earth observation is a central part in all this discussion. And the conference of parties means mm -hmm. that all parties get together and says, well, okay, this is our public good and this we have to take care of. And the private sector can play an extremely important role by producing the data, by being very innovative, having new data types, having new services, new mechanisms. But the public good, which means the parties, all these parties, now they get together and fund it and then distribute it like WML does it with data for, for many, many decades. No? And to set aside uh, national interests, because this is what happened for a long time in the ecological community, where data exchange was needed on one hand, but the national interests were still pretty strong. Once you overcome the hurdle to say, okay, I give, I provide my data, you provide your data, and the synergy is not just one and one, but is two by two, it's to the square, it's exponential. That's the, the picture you've thought about the landscape, the landscape data usage. No? Then you get in a completely new type of data usage on one hand, and on the other hand, you give more incentives to the private sector to develop new services. Because once the services are here, they are used, and we have seen it, for example, with Spire and the, the, the sounding, the GNSS sounding from, from satellites, which during the, the very critical phase we had when there were no planes flying in the, during the pandemic. These data were extremely valuable for the vertical profile uh, for the IFS, for the ESM model. No? This is a typical combination where the private sector has been very innovative. The public sector helps the private sector, the data made available for all of us, and you make all the of us together make a big new step. Sorry. Uh, where do you see UNOSA's role? What should we, what could be done at UNOSA, UNOSA level, at the multilateral level to improve the situation? Maybe Albrecht, you want to add something? I think the strength of uh, NOSA is um, that they have a, uh, a very good experience in uh, capacity building. And we are talking about information which shall be provided to the end users. Um, and I think this is a field uh, where NOSA can contribute a lot to this. And uh, so I think um, this is one of the, the, the focus area where they can work on it. I see Sarah, she wants to add something. <laughs> yes. I don't want to force anybody. If I misunderstand your face, then okay, okay. <laughs> then please tell me. <laughs> no, 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 of course. Um, yes, uh, well, as I explained in my in my presentation, um, there are is existing processes in place where um, well, space agencies and GEO and other key partners like WMO, have been involved for a long time uh, within the UNFCCC context and the negotiations and where the international earth observation policy is defined. So um, as Barbara mentioned, um, at COP26 for the first time, private sector partners were invited to participate in the Earth Information Day, which was a, um, yeah, a, an important moment, and hopefully this will continue and be expanded going forward. So I think UNUSA could provide a contribution on, on that front, uh, providing information uh, to policymakers at the Earth Information Day and related um, negotiations, uh, and also building on what Albrecht said uh, for further engagement and, and capacity building uh, using the existing structure. Thank you very much. And now, of course, I would invite um, you and USA to participate in the GEO um, activities. More you and USA is already a participating organization to GEO, so we should definitely um, strengthen this cooperation. 
Super. Michael, you raised your hand. Yeah, I mean, I can speak from the experience from WMO. WMO has, in comparison to NASA and OIMA, uh, ESA, for example, a tiny budget, a tiny budget, just a few percent. No? But it's a mutual con convention space that people get together. And if in these spaces, questions are defined in the right way. And if you have a neutral space to see, what okay, this is a scenario to solve a problem, scenario A, B, and C, no? getting people together like conference of parties. No? It's a very good way to, to make a step forward. Decisions then are taken in the ESA Council, for example, where countries commit financial resources. No? That's a different level than with real decisions. But pointing out scenarios can be an extremely helpful step in between. International diplomacy, multilateralism. Barbara, you also want to add something? I will. I'll just add one thing to that, um, just to maybe build on Michael's um, comments. Um, I, I worked for WMO for uh, four years before going into GEO uh, as the director of their space program, and we partnered with UN, WMO and um, UN USA partnered at that time to put together a brochure that said, what are all the UN organizations doing in climate change. Um, and at the time, I think, uh, I think UN USA was successful getting Ban Ki-moon to actually sign the forward for that brochure. You know, at that time, it probably wasn't even in soft copy. There are probably just some old copies around it. But for me, that was a good example where the entire UN family was trying to come together and two key players at the time were uh, WMO and UN USA. We, we also dipped down to the individual observing systems for GCOS, GOOS, and GTOS at the time. So um, I might encourage people to try and find uh, that publication as a model for collaboration mm -hmm. as well. Thanks. Thank you very much. I just asked the colleagues, is there a question in the chat which we should pick up? Because I see that we are running out of time. But of course, Markus would took a little bit of our time at the beginning, so we can, I think... <laughs> have more time. The colleagues, is there some a question in the chat which we should raise here? Um, certainly we can eat up a bit more in the time. Um, that's perfectly fine for us. Um, there's two questions, but they have been directly been addressed by, by Sarah and, and Barbara directly in the chat. So for the others who haven't had a chance to read it, um, there, were one, there was one question about the outreach uh, and education program by GEO directly, which was answered by Sarah and then uh, a second question, how industry uh, would look at the initiative to pool purchasing a uh, public pur purchasing power together. So maybe maybe that's also an interesting question for the for the panel uh, at, at large to expand this question. How would industry look at the initiative to pool public purchasing power together, similar like other other initiative and whether this would drive the cost um, costs down? That's that that have been the two questions on Slido and the other questions have already been addressed in the in the chat. Over to you. Okay. So you got the questions because I understood, didn't understood everything. <laughs> but I what I understood is that how it could be could a cooperation also with the industry and the industry sector. So maybe Barbara and Michael, you want to answer on these questions as well? Yeah, I'd be happy to jump in again, and I did put uh, a response in the in the chat. I do think your uh, industry would look at a proposal like that favorably. If uh, if there are entities out there that could, in fact, pool resources, uh, that would be looked favorably. I think it will have a tendency to drive down the cost and or create opportunities like the Norway example or like the Maxar example, well, where they will open up selected data sets. Um, but again, the law, but those are kind of one off deals. I think the long term trend will actually be moving away from data C as the currency and moving towards services. Okay. I like, I like the, <laughs> this development, honestly speaking. <laughs> Michael, you want to add something? No, I could not have formulated it as good as Barbara did. It's perfect. Yeah. Uh, so I think we are at the end and I would close it with having services and not data as a currency. I think that's a good, a good, very good conclusion for this session and also for what we are doing in this entire Space for Climate Action Initiative. And 
I see Markus on the screen, so I would like to hand over to Markus and have a big thank you to all of you for this extremely important and extremely interesting discussion and presentations and many thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for, for joining us at the session. Um, I heard a lot of recommendations for you in USA. There will be a, a lot of work on our side to, to digest what, what has been inputted. And it's, it's really, I'm looking forward to working together with, with all of you on the, ne on the next steps. Um, as some of you, I guess, already are leaving because you have arranged uh, the one-on-one -on -one bilateral meeting. So we are having now the first matchmaking session. Um, still, as a reminder, feel free to, to sign up um, through the links which you shared in the, shared in the chat. Um, that's accessible for everyone. You can you can uh, access the other profiles and make uh, and request bilateral meetings. So that's for the next coming 90 minutes, and then we will resume at, um, at five o'clock for the closing session of today, which is the youth perspective on space-based climate action. We have heard about the youth perspective already today in the in the morning. In the in the opening session, it was mentioned as an important element of the of COP and the outcome of COP. We also have heard about the youth COP in in Milan and what the results were there. So um, it's going to be another exciting element for for the World Space Forum in order to drive the discussion forward. So thank you very much for for joining us at this session, and we will welcome and we look forward to welcoming you back at five o'clock. So that's in two. It's in one and a half hours, uh, five o'clock Central European time. So in 90 minutes, we will resume this session. Thank you very much. Have a good, have good bilateral and, and matchmaking meetings. Thank you. <laughs>